Denver thinks it has an approach to homelessness that works three out of four times. So how do we see more of it? The lawyer claiming that XL Energy caused the Marshall Fire is also claiming that underground coal mine fires caused the Marshall Fire. A legal lesson in covering your bases. A nationwide effort to fake a grassroots campaign got help in Colorado from a former mayor who explains to us why he got involved. And do you know this man? He made enough of an impact on Denver and the world that he's getting the bronze treatment in downtown, no less. All that is next. The city of Denver says it's found a successful approach to addressing homelessness, which might come as a surprise to anyone who has recently been in Denver. With the claim that this has a 77% success rate, Arnu Sheroy wants to know more about it and how the city can scale up the approach. It's what's happening inside buildings like this in Denver that the city says is working so well. Addressing homelessness with a housing resource. It's affordable housing with wraparound services that's reaching some of the hardest to reach people. People who had been pretty disconnected from our systems of support that were largely having multiple arrests and jail uh, as well as emergency room visits in a year. And so we showed that even for those who had been a little bit more far removed from some of these supports, once they were housed and had support, more than 77% were still successfully housed three years later. But how do you reconcile that with what we've been showing you, like the situation at Union Station, with drug use, drug-related arrests, and people experiencing homelessness? Civic Center Park temporarily shut down in the fall for public health and environmental risks. We have 190 of these you know, long-term vouchers that were an emergency intervention uh, for 190 people experiencing homelessness. Well, we have around 5,000 on any given day. But we're pretty far behind the eight ball because we weren't doing it when we started to see increases in homelessness. The city is working on opening up 1,800 supportive housing units in the next decade. But what about now? Over the course of last year, nearly 12,900 people were living unsheltered. It's like using motels and hotels, which the city is doing right now, but we may need to do that on a longer term basis. Um, we could look at other, you know, unused properties. I think the safe outdoor spaces have been very successful for a lot of people. I can't promise that no one will ever have a housing crisis resulting in homelessness. That includes the city's reality check. But what we want to get to is the point where we have enough housing resources for and that it matches the number of people in housing crisis that's resulted in homelessness every month. That's what functional zero is. So one area of improvement is helping more veterans. We heard about that today, both from the city and then also read about it in a report from the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. For that big picture, though, the goal is to bring 7,000 affordable housing units online in the next five years. That's going to include more of those housing units that are mm -hmm. wrapped up with those support services, which is key to making this work. Voters had said yes to setting aside that money back in 2020. So that's what's going to be helping to fund that going forward. You often hear that when something like this is offered to some folks who are living on the street, they're resistant because their strings attached, that kind of thing. What's the reception been like? Yeah, so we asked Kathy with the Coalition for the Homeless who helped with that initial outreach. They said the first 100 people they reached out to, 99 said, yeah, we want this help. We want to mm -hmm. opt in. But it wasn't a yes from the get-go. They had to build that relationship. They had to build that trust. And then people started moving into some of these housing units. We asked the same thing about how many people are actually opting to go to shelters. And Kathy said, it's the same thing. It was just dependent person to person. If they felt comfortable there, could they bring all of their belongings with them? What were the rules? And then COVID was playing a role in that as well. It's great to see people with concrete approaches as opposed mm -hmm. to just talk about things, you know. Anusha, thank you. The group that's suing XL Energy, claiming that XL caused the Marshall Fire, insisted to us this week that they weren't fishing for information. They thought they had a concrete case. Well, now we learn that same group has given notice it plans to sue Boulder County for failing to contain underground coal seam fires. Both power lines and underground fires have been speculated about as possible causes of the fire. So why sue over one when you can sue over both? Our colleague Kevin Vaughn from our Nine Wants to Know team reported last month on three potential ignition sources for the fire that were being examined. Power lines, underground mine fires, and some burning that had taken place a week earlier on the 12 tribes religious property. Just yesterday, the Boulder County Sheriff's Office said it could be months before a cause is known and shared publicly. 
The legal notice that was given to Boulder County says the damages to two businesses that did not burn are $350,000 a piece. It's the El Dorado Market and a liquor store there at Highway 93 and Highway 170. They are the only named victims in this new potential suit. Other victims to be announced, meaning the lawyers just haven't signed them up yet. Today, Boulder County announced the logistics of their debris removal plan. The work will start in a few weeks in the El Dorado neighborhood in Louisville, Sagamore and Original Town in Superior, and Marshall in unincorporated Boulder County. There are going to be 30 crews out working the project. 15 will start in Superior, 9 in Louisville, 6 in unincorporated Boulder County. They're eventually going to post a map online to track their progress. Homeowners will be contacted by the county to verify their information and get the final go-ahead. It'll also give people a chance to tell the county what they do and do not want taken off their property. Denver leaders were saying today that what they're seeing is the single largest federal investment in the South Platte in the history of the city. $350 million for the Denver and Adams County South Platte River Project. The goal will be to restore the ecosystem along about 6.5 miles of the river. They want to make it more welcoming both for people and for wildlife and continue to chip away at the flood risk that was laid bare most recently in 1965. A massive flood of the Platte killed 20 people. Dams have been built since then, but the risk has not been eliminated. We just haven't had a big enough event. Any, no matter what you build, there's always a chance of an event that will top it. We do have a, a couple of um, places on the river where 1% a uh, storm will spill out of the banks of the river and flood adjacent areas. So this will allow us to go back and fix those areas. This is a long operation. The project has a rough timeline of about five to ten years. So you know the term political grassroots, right? It means widespread support from the bottom up to leadership. Then there's AstroTurf. That is a fake manufactured campaign to make it look like there's a grassroots movement for or against a cause. Typically, it's big money interest paying to organize the appearance of public support. The Washington Post exposed a glaring example this week where the AstroTurf extended to Colorado and involved a former mayor here. The AstroTurf campaign, according to the Washington Post, was Facebook's parent company hiring a Republican political firm to organize a campaign against TikTok to make it look like Facebook's rival was facing public backlash for dangerous trends. The Post got internal emails that pulled back the AstroTurf. One email celebrated a March 12th letter to the editor of the Denver Post. The letter writer didn't respond to the Washington Post questions, but former Dillon Mayor Kevin Burns did reply to ours. Burns says he stands by his letter and its views, even knowing that Facebook's parent company was behind the fake grassroots campaign. Burns works for a public relations and government affairs firm called Summit Info Services, but he says that his letter was not part of a paid contract for that company. All he would say is that he was contacted by a former colleague to write the letter. It's tough to dig beneath the surface to see what's really going on here. With AstroTurf, that's the point. The namesake of Rose Medical Center is getting a statue in downtown Denver. Yeah, Rose Medical Center is named for a person, not for a flower. And the person was a big deal. Maurice Rose was raised in Denver, went to East High School, and the general went on to become one of the most important figures in World War II. Our Marshall Zellinger shows us how a pillar of Colorado's Jewish community is being immortalized in bronze. I believe we started this project almost three years ago. Among the historical figures in George Lundin's Loveland studio. He looked like he came right off of a Hollywood set. There is one famous face you may not recognize. I had a couple of fellas from Denver came up a couple of years ago and, and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a sculpture of General Rose. And I looked him straight in the face and I said, who is General Rose? General Maurice Rose of Rose Medical Center fame. No, I don't think he had much to do with medicine. He was out there trying to kill Nazis. <laughs> Most people thought the hospital was named after a rose, a flower. Not anymore. Make that General Maurice Rose of World War II fame. He was to Eisenhower what Grant was to Lincoln. Marshall Fogel, who wrote an extensive biography on General Rose, is helping make sure when you hear Rose, you know who we're talking about. He was the most decorated battle tank commander in U.S. military history. He's kind of a forgotten hero 
And I think it's important that uh, future generations of Coloradans know about General Rose. Paul Shaman helped convince lawmakers to pass a resolution allowing the statue to be placed in Lincoln Veterans Memorial Park right across from the Capitol. I hope they get an education. There'll be a QR code where they can learn more about General Rose. Unfortunately, most of the shots you see of General Rose, he doesn't have much of an expression on his face. So when I do him, I'm going to try to give him a little bit more of an expression. With all this attention to detail. Do that until it looks a lot like a 45. It seems surprising what happens next for this creation made of styrofoam, steel, wood, and clay. Then we actually chopped the whole piece into about 10 or 12 pieces. The dissection happened yesterday. Not because they're starting over. It's really the start. The pieces are waxed, taken to a foundry where another mold is made. The wax is melted out, and what's left is poured full of bronze. So General Rose can stand ready to lead again. He's a national hero that has been unrecognized for too many years. The bronze version of General Rose is supposed to be ready to be installed on Colorado Day, August 1st. No taxpayer money is being used for this, for those clamoring somewhere about the cost. It's, it's about a million dollars for the statue, a stone path to the statue, and the monument it will sit on, and lights to keep it seen at night, but none of it is taxpayer money. That is, that's really prominent placement in Denver, too. I mean, right there, kind of out the front steps of the Capitol. And the sculptor, George Lundin, he's done some pretty recognizable work around town. Yeah, you may recognize him from previous works as L. Ray Jeppesen at the DIA Terminal and the baseball player outside Coors Field, which you, you quizzed me. I think it's just general baseball player and not anyone specific, but now i got to go back and check. It's just a dude? Just a guy with a bat just welcoming you to the corner of 20th and Blake. Just a guy who likes baseball. Could be any of us. That's the beauty of the statue. How about that? Oh, great story. Thank you, Marshall. This state's love for our pets is pretty legendary. So much so that other states send animals facing euthanasia here, knowing that they're going to find loving homes in Colorado. The nonprofit Animal Friends Alliance works to find them forever homes in northern Colorado. And since Wednesday, you have raised almost $40,000 to support their work. I mean, we are so close that I bet you like the first 10 people that scan the QR code or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 are going to put them over that mark. Animal Friends Alliance is expanding its work right now, trying to keep pets and people together through hard times, through a low-cost vet clinic and a pet food pantry. They're a guaranteed adoption shelter, so they are often a last resort for a very good girl or boy who can be adopted but just simply hasn't found the right fit elsewhere. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign donations will help them find homes. Marijuana moves closer to decriminalization federally. Colorado's well past that. I mean, Denver is advertising for a new pot guru. We have some fun in the sun for your Friday good news. I got my favorite hat on. <laughs> Smart, you don't want one of those Colorado spring sunburns. All that is next. The United States House passed a bill today that would decriminalize marijuana at the federal level. If you're thinking Colorado's whole delegation would be like, oh yeah, we're doing that, it's going okay, no big deal. Not, not really, no. Uh, all three of Colorado's Republicans in the House voted against decriminalization of marijuana federally. That bill now goes to the Senate. City of Denver's looking for a new pot czar. What they call the most unique government job in the world is vacant once again. Joey Pena has been the city's cannabis process navigator for almost three years. Uh, Joey's moving out of state, so the Department of Excise and Licensing is looking for his replacement. The job's more paperwork than rolling papers. It's uh, working with cannabis businesses to navigate rules and regulations, helping new businesses get through their licensure. It's an important role in a booming business, because last year, the cannabis industry generated almost $700 million in sales in Denver alone. So the city's pretty anxious to fill this pot czar job. We see it pays $79,000 to $129,000 a year. So if you'd like to apply on behalf of somebody who won't move out of your basement, we'll put the application in this story on 9news.com.
Clear skies after a fast-moving weather system crossed the state earlier today. We're off to a nice weekend warming trend with rain showers back in the forecast early next week. Temperatures a smidge cooler today, but I wouldn't call 55 in Denver cold. We're headed the other direction tomorrow. And our storm will produce showers and storms from Minneapolis to Omaha down to Oklahoma City tonight. While here in Colorado, high pressure is coming in, storm track to the north, and that means limited cloud cover, beautiful conditions to get up into the high country for some spring skiing or a day golfing tomorrow, running or walking along the front range. Just gorgeous. Sunshine close to 70 Saturday, upper 50 Sunday. Showers return Tuesday afternoon. And these fish are posted pre-spawn feeding up on the flats. This is a, that's bad news. Nope, not a lot around here on a Friday. Only good news. So what do you got? My good news is that, that, is that. Take your time. We've got all half hour. It's the official start of boating season in Colorado, why I'm wearing salmon. So our Tom Cole grabbed his floaties to go out and ask our every Friday question at Cherry Creek Reservoir. Forget the headlines on TV. What's your good news? My good news is that, that, is that. My good news, I tell you what, look, look at what we're dealing with right now. You know, talk about the, the world of opportunity. Great weather, opening for boating, and recreation is at its biggest point. I buried him in the water. So I'm going out with my good buddy Chris, and I got my kids out here. So, uh, yeah, opening day, getting the lay of the land, and, uh, yeah, just kicking off the season. I think we should put a shovel in there. You want to get your shovel mm -hmm. shot? All right. My good news is, is that my family is here, beautiful Colorado, the lake. It's everything. Well, my good news is it's spring. I'm out here fishing on the boat. I'm about to go to a trip to Maui. I have a one-year-old son who is amazing, just finished his swim class. And my wife is actually pregnant with our second. So for all of you that don't know, now you do. I made a swimming pool. And my good news is uh, the park's open. It's uh, sunny and it's warming up. And um, I got my favorite hat on. I usually call it my cow hat. My good news is it's open boating and there's lots of fishing in the season. Good news in my life and just in Colorado, I'm an outdoorsman. My life is in the outdoors and I'll tell you, you cannot beat it right now. My name's Ryan, I'm 16 and I'm happy to be out here this spring, enjoy God's beautiful creation and catch some fish. Mm, that, 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 that the fishermen are in fishing boats because if they, because it, because if they were just fishing with fishing rods, we wouldn't have been here. Thank you for making a movie about me. Can we see the movie? Five years of your Friday good news. I think that's the first pregnancy announcement. How about that? That's very cool. Hey, we've got a sign for you that we, we debated whether to show. It's a little gross, but it made everybody in the newsroom laugh. So we'll show it next. It's a sign, and one of the first that we actually have to warn you about before we show it, because some people are eating dinner right now, and if you're doing that, you might want to go uh, on mute or just raise your conversation level for just a moment. All right, ready to see it? This is bad, but it made us laugh, so just, just show, show the sign. Septic truck driving down Highway 287 in Longmont yesterday. Sign on the back says, yesterday's Meals on Wheels. I, okay, I'm sorry. Everybody in the newsroom laughed at that. Maybe that says more about us than the sign. I'm not sure. Appreciate that being sent to us. But you're also welcome to send us things that are not disturbing, Ann, uh, or everybody. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention on Twitter with the hashtag HeyNext. Lisa writes in tonight about Marshall Zellinger's reporting on the coming bronze statue of General Maurice Rose downtown to say, if you have lived here long enough, then you know that it used to be called General Rose Hospital. Inger writes in to say, when was the last time you wore that pink jacket? Not sure if it's pink or what color it is, but you do know that I keep the little cards here. It was October 4th of 2021. Have a great weekend. See you next time.